What just happened? Save or cancel. All right, we're we're concluding our series on photobond holidays today, and we, every week we've been showing you pictures. We're going to show you some pictures of ones that have been released recently on the uh, Facebook, and there we have a photo bomb going on there. Is that Wendy? I'm not quite sure who that is. Okay, let's go to the next one. And there we have uh, Frozen. It looks like the Frozen set here, doesn't it, today? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and the next one. And then we have, uh, okay, another one, and one more there. And there is Rebecca. Okay, any other ones? I think that's it. So if you have any photo bomb, what we're going to do after today, I'm going to try to get the media folks or whoever's and help me with this. We're going to put all the photo bombs up we've had over the last three weeks and we're going to ask you to vote on them on Facebook, or maybe we'll put them on our website if I can figure out how to do that. And then whoever gets the most will get an all-expenses-paid trip to an eating establishment in the local area that has golden arches. So you don't want to miss out. <laughs> you don't want to miss out on that, so that's what's happening. But uh, in case if you're your first time here and you're wondering what is a photobomb, a basic photobomb is when you have a picture and somebody interrupts the picture, some, a person or an event, something that messes the picture up. And we're talking about photobomb Christmas and how often uh, during the holiday se seasons, it doesn't it seem that everything is kind of ramped up just a little bit. I mean, the happiness is ramped up, the bills are ramped up, the stress levels ramped up. It seems like everything goes to a higher level during the holiday season. And also, sometimes things go wrong. I, I don't know, are you, am I the only person that things tend to go wrong during Christmas and New Year's and Thanksgiving? I. I I, let's just say this. Over the years, I've I had some of the most, um, shall we say, challenging times in the family life uh, during that time. It's something that invariably happens. There's a misunderstanding or something like that, and problems begin to happen. Am I the only one here that has that problem? I feel all alone up here. Okay, <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, and so that's what often happens, and it just seems to highlight it more. We've been talking about that and, oh, over the years, over the years, over the weeks, end of the years. We mentioned the fact that God works all things for good for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. We mentioned that. But today, uh, we're going to talk about this. What happens when your plans are photobombed? When your plans are photobombed. In other words, you make plans and your plans get messed up. Especially when you believe that God has given you a plan. And you thought you heard from God about this. You thought this was God's will. And somehow it gets messed up. And you're wondering, where are you, God? How did this happen in my life? And the Christmas story is full of photobombs, isn't it? We mentioned a little bit last week what happened. What happened to Mary, 14, 13 years old. All of a sudden she says, I'm pregnant. Who's the father? God's the father. What? You know, and then Joseph finds us out and... Remember, they were engaged, and, and that culture, I don't know if you realize this, and that culture, and engagement was a big deal. It was a big celebration. The whole community understood about engagement. Everyone knew, oh, Mary and Joseph are going to get married. It's not like today where you get engaged, and you might put it on Facebook or something, or Instagram or Twitter. No, this is something where the whole community would know you got engaged. It was a big deal. It was very much more serious than our engagement today. It was almost like a precursor to marriage. It was a big celebration, and then, of course, the marriage, the whole community got involved in the, in the town got involved. It was a big deal. And so think about that. I mean, talk about your plans being messed up. And we talked about how Mary is an extraordinary person in history that we can learn a lot from. Out of everyone in the Christmas story, the people that perhaps handled it the best was Mary and the pagans from the Far East. Those are the two people that handled it the best. But the religious community, those that knew better, had a hard time with it. Why? Because plans we're messed up. Things do not go according to plan. How do you and I handle that when our plans are photobombed, when things that we thought God told us to do, maybe God, you feel like God told you to marry this person, you believe it was God, and now uh, you're divorced, and now you have to go to like three different Christmas events, you have to go to the, the ex-mother and father-in-law, you have to go to this other person's house, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible, I thought I was in the will of God, it was prophesied that we're supposed to be married, now I'm divorced, now we're remarried, I'm not happy in this marriage, and, and all this stuff happens, you're like, God, where are you in all this, and it's frustrating, 
I mean, maybe you, you know, your situation, you, you're not quite sure what's going to happen over the holidays. Are you going to let your job go? It's a new year. What's going to happen? Maybe you got, you're thinking, God, pray, you're praying for a child all your life. You, God gives you a child, and now your child is wild. <laughs> and you're having a hard time. You know, you're like, God, I, I don't know why I prayed for this for. This is tough. I don't know, but we all go through stuff. And maybe this, maybe you have a health issue that has come up. And you're struggling with your health issue. And you're having, struggling either mentally, or physically, or emotionally. You're struggling with something. God, where are you in the middle of it? And these plans that you thought you had were messed up. The Christmas story is full of plans that were messed up, where God seemed to mess it up. And the religious people, the people that were waiting for the Messiah, completely missed the coming of Jesus because they thought he was going to come a certain way. And he came totally different than that. What I find so amazing as I look through the Christmas story, I think of the um, we three kings. Well, first of all, they weren't three kings. Uh, we believe they were probably about 12. And they came from the Far East, probably in the area of Ur, where Abraham came from. And these people were pagans. They were not Jewish. They were not believers. And they followed astrology, and they looked at the stars for answers. But their heart was to know God. The Bible says, if you will seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And so they were earnestly seeking God. And what did God do? God spoke to them through the stars, incidentally enough. He used their own pagan mechanisms to bring them to Christ. Isn't that amazing? And they travel, and they, they come to Bethlehem, and they, they talk to Herod, and Herod gets all excited about it, and he wants to kill this baby Jesus. And so we'll get into it a little later on, but I find it amazing that these pagan people get it while the church of Christ, of Jesus' day when he was a baby, did not get it. And Why? I think partially is we're more interested sometimes in having it our way than God's way. And Christmas is a wonderful opportunity to teach us that. You might have heard some of these scriptures, and uh, I've heard this on uh, Jeremiah 29 11. I have plans to prosper you and give you hope and a future. Okay, God's going to prosper me, going to give me hope and a future. God's got good plans for me. I know it. The Bible says, you know, I shall be the head and not the tail. And you believe all these wonderful things. And then you find that not happening in your life. I don't feel like I'm the, I don't want the head, I'm the tail. And I'm being wagged. And I can't control it. So what happens? And you says, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no has entered the heart of men. The great things that God has for them. We hear all these promises, and yet we don't see these promises coming to happen. Instead, we see the opposite taking place. Difficulty happens. The plans that you have are falling apart. The finances are falling apart. Maybe a, a parent is sick, or you're sick, or whatever. And all these things are happening, and their plans are messed up. How do we handle that? Then we also read in Psalm 37, 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And you've delighted yourself in the Lord, and you're not getting the desires of your heart. But partially, I think the problem has been, me too, is sometimes we say that Jesus Christ is the answer for everything, which is true. But if you want to be happy, go to Jesus. If you want a better job, go to Jesus. If you want a better car, go to Jesus. If you want a better church, stay at Cornerstone. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> So, <laughs> just kidding with you. But all these things, and, and what begins to happen is we turn Jesus into an idol. We turn him into an American idol. Jesus is here to make me happy. Jesus is here to make me prosperous. And if it's not prosperous and I'm not happy, it must not be God. Because after all, the most important thing in the world is to be happy. And that's what Jesus is here for. Jesus died on the cross to make me happy. And unfortunately, we begin to believe that, don't we? And if we're not happy and things are not going well, then God must abandon me. And so this is what can happen to us, and this is what happened often in the Christmas story as well. But how do you handle when things don't go well? How do you handle when your plans blow up? What happens when you think you're supposed to go to school and you move across the country, you run out of money, you fail out of school, you come back home, and you're embarrassed? How about this? You say, well, God told me I'm supposed to go here. And, and you go there, and six months later, you're back. What happened to God? Well, uh, and you hear all this type of thing, and you're frustrated with it. Your plans do not go right. Or... Perhaps the worst thing can happen. This is probably the most dangerous thing. Everything you plan goes fantastic. You plan to go to school. You graduate top of your class, no debt. 
you plan to start a business, your business flourishes, and it's like everything you touch turns to gold, and it gets to such a degree, you're kind of, you know, I got this thing together pretty good, you feel pretty good about yourself, and you begin, you're a self-made man or a woman, and you feel pretty confident in yourself, and your world is going great, and you're sitting here today, saying, well, all these, all these other people got problems, but you know what, church is for losers, I'm a winner, and things are going well for me, I just come to church for the kids. And you start thinking that way, you got it all together. I have to tell you that if, if that's your attitude, that's a dangerous place to be. But what do we do and how do we handle the situation when your life is photobombed? What happens during this? I'm going to ask you to open your Bible, perhaps one of the most famous passages of Scripture in the Bible. I encourage you to memorize this particular passage of Scripture. It's found in Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will will direct your paths. It also says in verse 7, as we continue to read forward, verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And so the Bible is telling us to trust in the Lord and trust them with everything, not just some things. So let's go ahead and look at the first phrase here. Trust in the Lord with your whole heart. What is that supposed to mean? Trust in the Lord with your own heart. Well, trust, by the way, I, I looked this up. Trust in the Lord with your own heart and lean not in your own understandings. There was a gentleman in the South Pacific that was trying to translate the Bible to a bunch of cannibals, the former cannibals. And so as they were trying to put salt and pepper on him, eating him, he was trying to figure a way to figure out how to translate the word trust. Because obviously you can imagine in a cannibalistic society, the word trust is kind of an, an oxymoron. And then he was sitting there, and as he's leaning on his chair and on two legs against the wall, he said, ah, I got it, putting my total weight upon. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your understanding. So trust with your whole heart. And by the way, when it says heart, it means everything that you are. Do you find that I, I have a hard time trusting God for certain areas of my life and other areas I have no problem at all? Am I the only one? There's just certain areas I, I, I can trust God that his will is going to happen. He's going to take care of the world and all that. But I'm not quite sure I'm going to be able to pay the bills. I'm not quite sure that God's going to help me with that. I'm not quite sure God can help me with my health issues. I'm not afraid to die, but I'm afraid how I'm going to die. And I'm not quite sure how God's going to handle that part. What's going to happen? Am I going to get sick? How am I going to die one day? Am I going to have to go to hospice? And you start thinking all these type of thoughts. And you get fearful. I've talked to many people that are um, a little more advanced in life, and they're a little afraid that what's going to happen if my spouse dies, I'm going to be all by myself, and the fear begins to happen. How am I supposed to trust God in those types of things? The Bible says, trust, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding, trust. Well, how do you do that? Have you ever wondered how pilots fly at night? It's just fascinating to me how pilots fly at night. I don't know if you realize this. I'm not a pilot. Uh, by the way, just as a side note, I, I thought one of the coolest people in the Bible was Pontius Pilate. And someone asked me, who do you want to be in the Bible? I want to be Pontius Pilate because I thought he was a pilot. Anyhow, that's beside the point. I, but anyhow, so what happens at night, if you're flying at night, that you have to completely rely upon your gauges. And so if you're flying someplace, well, I feel like there's mountains over there, and so I'm going to turn this way. No, you can't rely on your feelings. You have to rely upon your gauges because I've read that you can be upside down and not even realize it unless you look at your gauges. And so when you trust in the Lord, what you begin to do is say, or your own heart, you say, okay, I'm not going to trust my emotions. I'm not going to trust my reason. I'm going to trust his word. What is that supposed to mean? That means what he says in his word, I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust that God is with me. Though I don't know what's going on, I'm going to trust in him and begin to believe what he says and do what he says. What's that? How is that supposed to work in real life? You know, don't you get tired of all these cliches? Hey, brother, just trust God. Thanks a lot. That's going to help me a lot. I got bills to pay, mouths to feed and mama's sick in the hospital, and you're asking me to trust in God. I'm not quite sure where God is at this point, so when he comes, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. Right now, I've got to make things work on my own. And so it can get that way, can't it? But let me just, let me bring you to one of the major points today is this. 
One of the major points is, if you want to open your Bibles, the 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. The Bible says you're not your own. I was reading a, recently a story about Greg Laurel. He's a president, president. He's a pastor in, in, in California, the Calvary Chapel Church. Good guy. And he told a story, it's a true story, of a woman that uh, she packed some heat. She liked to pack a little heat. And she was an older lady, about five foot three, and had gray hair and big Coke bottle glasses. And she went to go shopping. And she came back, and to her dismay and her uh, utmost fear, she found four suspicious men sitting in her car. So she pulled her gun out and screamed, get out of my car, I'll shoot. These four guys got out of the car, and they ran as fast as they could. She couldn't even find them. So she's like, and she's heart's beating. She gets in her car. She pulls out her key. She puts it in ignition. doesn't fit. And she realizes that her car is four cars down. So she's, oh, my gosh, what did I do? She starts her car up, her appropriate car. She drives to the police station. She goes in. She's like, I'm going to turn myself in. I, I, I carjacked somebody. She's sitting there talking to the policeman at the table, and the other side of these four young guys saying, we were carjacked by an old lady. And the commissioner guy, he laughed his head off. He said, ah, oh, and they dropped the charges. But the problem was this. She thought the car was her car, and it was not her car. My friends, one of the biggest problems, if you're in Christ, you think this is your life, it's not your life. I have news for you today. If you give your life to Christ, you've sacrificed your rights. You've handed over your ownership to Jesus Christ. You will no longer have a right over yourself. You're saying, gee, you know what? I'm not quite sure I want to be a Christian. Well, so what does the Bible say that? Well, let's go ahead and look at the Scripture. It says, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Why? You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I like to glorify God in my spirit. But my body? You mean I can't eat what I want to eat? I can't do what I want to do? I can't, hey, I can wear what I want to wear. I can do what I want to do. This is my body. This is what I have found. I have found that we're really good in the Western culture to compartmentalize our lives. I'll give God church. I'll give God my family. I'll give God this. But he's not going to tell me what I'm supposed to eat or drink or whatever or where. That's not about that. I, this is mine. And we tend to compartmentalize God into different, different cavities, different areas. And we wonder why we're not having the complete success we're supposed to have in the complete way of God. Why? Because God says what? Trust in the Lord with all your, own, with all your heart. The Bible says right here, your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God and your body and your spirit. You see, when the Apostle Paul wrote that, he wrote that to a culture that thought in the early church, they thought what you did in the body didn't matter because your body was going to pass away, it's called, and they believed what you did in the spirit was important. It separated the two, and I think we do the same today. Well, who are you to tell me what to do? I, I want to do what I want to do. I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. I want to do things my way, and we often say this way. We compartmentalize our life, but God says, no, unless I have it all, I have nothing. You see, you and I are designed to be completely submitted to God. Unless you're completely submitted to God, it doesn't work. Something goes wrong. Why? Because you're designed by God for God until you understand that and surrender yourself to God, you're going to hurt yourself and other people. You're going to hear me say that phrase millions of times because it's the truth. That's the basic premise of, our, of how we're designed and how we're made. So you're bought with a price. So until we stop trying to make plans and allow Him to make our plans... We're going to be frustrated ultimately because we can go through our life wasting our time and at the end of our life saying, what did I get right? Matter of fact, you may feel like you're going nowhere. Some of you are thinking here this morning, you know, my life is not really going anywhere. I thought by this age, by 40, by 30, by 20, I'd be this way, but I feel like I'm going nowhere. But I have good news for you today. Do you realize that everyone here right now is going somewhere? Do you realize that? All of you are, are getting somewhere fast. I was just reading this past week that you may feel you're sitting still, but you know the planet Earth is spinning right now over 1,000 miles per hour. So right now, you're traveling, spinning on the planet Earth 1,000 miles per hour, and every 24 hours, the Earth pulls out a celestial 360. Not only that, do you also realize that you're hurling through space at 67,000 miles per hour, that our galaxy literally is going 67,000 miles per hour? 
And on top of that, the Milky Way, which is the conglomerate where our galaxy is found, is traveling at 1,599,793 miles through space. Wow. So right now, you guys are traveling at an extraordinary rate of speed. Isn't that amazing to me? Isn't that amazing? We think we understand all this. The Bible says, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. If you think you understand how things are supposed to be without God, you're sadly mistaken. Sadly mistaken. You know, I, I have a little four-year-old. My wife and I have a little four-year-old. His name is Matthew. Cutest thing in the world. I mean, he really is. All our kids were cute. But when they're four years old, there's something extra cute about them, right? They can, I mean, it's hard sometimes because I try to discipline him, and I'm laughing half the time. <laughs> Matthew, stop it. You know, we went to one time, we went to a men's warehouse, and we're looking at clothes. And, and all of a sudden, he rolls underneath the jackets. I'm like, where is he? And he starts like, doing like, a doing military thing. That I'm as, my wife's so embarrassed, I'm laughing. And, and, you know, and you try to tell him. Then all of a sudden, he wants to run to the parking lot and just start running to the parking lot. Matthew, stop. You have to grab him and explain to him, no, don't go. No, I want to go to the parking lot. No, you can't go in the parking lot. You're three foot five. You're going to get run over. We don't want to serve you for a pancake. Come on, Matthew. We're trying to explain to him. But he doesn't understand yet. Why? He has a four-year-old mind, and he thinks we're inhibiting his pleasures. In many ways, you and I are the same way. We think we understand what's best for us, and God knows the final outcome. He knows the impact your life will have. In fact, some of the things you will not understand until one day we're with God. And so there comes a point where you get to say, I have to trust in God and not myself. Jesus said in John 5, 19, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing by himself, but only does what he sees the Father doing. Jesus did nothing unless he saw the Father doing it. What is that supposed to mean? It means he didn't do things on his own. He was perfect. Jesus was perfect, and he relied on God. If Jesus was perfect and relied on God, how much more do we, being imperfect, have to rely upon God? I do nothing unless I see the Father doing it. I heard an interview by Billy Graham. I was reading this past week as well, uh, back in uh, 1974, a little while ago. He was on the Today Show. And they were asking him about prayer. He says, you know, I always pray. So I was, in a, I was praying on my way here. I'm praying during the interview. I'm praying no matter where I go. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Well, how's that supposed to be? How are you supposed to pray without ceasing? I think a lot of us, what we end to do with God is we have our prayer time. We go to church. Okay, God, I'll see you next week. We shut the door, we go about our business, and we forget about God until next week or until we pray for our meal. Or we're trying to get a parking space at the mall, okay? And so that's all. And so we forget to pray about him. He says, no, I pray always. I'm praying on the elevator. And so he always keeps him relying upon God. There's a great study, by the way. Uh, it's called Experiencing God, Henry Blackaby. Fantastic book we did a number of times uh, ago. And basically, the basic premise of this book is this. Find out what God is doing and join him in it. And when you realize it's not about you, it's about God. And so the Bible says right here, trust in the Lord, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In other words, acknowledge him in your marriage, acknowledge him with your body, acknowledge him with your finances, acknowledge him with your entertainment, what you watch, what you read, what you listen to, what you post. Acknowledge him in all areas. And he will direct your paths. It's not nice to know he'll direct your paths. He'll direct your paths. So when the future seems uncertain, Christ will do it for you. I find it very interesting. I was uh, looking at Psalm 23, and I said, what would happen if we took out the shepherd out of that passage of Scripture? So I, I'm going to read it to you. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is what it reads like without, without the shepherd. Verse 1, my, I shall be in want. Verse 2, me, me. Verse 3, my soul, me. Verse 4, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear me, me. Verse 5, in the presence of my enemies, my head, my cup. Verse 6, me, all the days of my life, I will dwell. Can you imagine? Look at that. Everything yourself, look what happens. It only works when Christ is 
the sender of it all, that we have to keep him in the midst of all that we're doing. Trust in the Lord with all your own heart. Lean not in your own understanding. I just find it so amazing how it's so easy for us not to do that. It's so easy for us to, to take it and try to make it happen on our own. Well, how do, you, how do you start to trust God? How do you lean in his own understanding? How do you change that in your life? How do you make it happen? How do you find what God's will is for your life? Probably the biggest question I hear is, what is God's will for my life? I remember a period of time when I was in my early 20s where I thought I knew exactly what God wanted me to do because I had it planned out and God had it endorse it. God, I got it all planned out. I want you to endorse what I want to do. And so what I would do is I'd keep God, instead of being real close to God, imagine this is God, not that I could talk that close to him, but he's right here. Instead of getting close to God and knowing his will, I'd go a little like this. Okay, God, I have these plans, but I'm afraid to submit them to you because this is what I want. And so I had these plans, and as a result of by God's grace, he messed my plans up because he, that was not his plan. But I was frustrated with God. God, you blew it. I thought I was supposed to do this, but I did not submit to him. Then I would submit myself to God, and then I still want to control about it. And it got to the point I was getting frustrated with God. God, show me what you're supposed to do. And I felt like one time God in my prayer time said, well, I'll tell you what to do once you do what I told you to do. In other words, the revelation I've shown you, do that first, and then I'll show you something else. Why would I pile more information upon you if you haven't done what I've told you to do? Why should I graduate you to sixth grade if you're still in third grade? Why should I give you more information? Not that I don't love you. You're more accountable to much is given, much is required. So if you're not going to do the little stuff I showed you, why should I show you other things? So when you don't know what to do right now, you don't know what God's will is, what is the revelation you have right now? What revelation do you have right now? What is it that you know God's calling you to do right now? Well, um, I guess he wants me to read the Bible, pray, go to church, um, I don't know. I, I guess that's basically it. Read my Bible and pray. And, uh, okay. And, and that sounds so cliche, doesn't it? But let me tell you something about that. I've been around literally the world, not that I'm trying to brag, but I have been around the world. I've, I've been to different cultures. And I've seen great men and women of God. And you know, that's something I found extraordinary. If, if, if for the next five, six weeks, let's say every week on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and Sundays, we're going to fly in the most notorious evangelists and the most powerful men and women of God, Joyce Myers, Billy Graham, you name it. Uh, and we're going to name all these great folks who are going to come in here. And they're going to lay hands on you. You're going to pray for God's revelation, that God would lead you and guide you to what he's called you to do. And, I, and, every, and we've come here. We had the greatest men and women of God. And then, if it was possible, we'd get a time machine. And then we bring in the Apostle Paul. We bring in Moses. Elisha, Elijah, and they would come too. You, have you lost it? Oh, just let me have a little fun here, okay? <laughs> and, 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 they were, and they would come to our church, and they'd pray for you. Guess what would happen to you without doing the basics? You'd get nowhere. Because you cannot live your life based upon someone else's life except for Jesus Christ. You see, the most important thing you and I can learn to do every single day is to get in his word every day. I know it sounds so simple and so crazy. Oh, here we go again. I read the Bible. I tried. I started at Genesis. Got through that. It was kind of cool. Uh, you know, Genesis, Exodus was kind of neat for a little while. And then Leviticus got a little crazy with the laws. And then I got the numbers, and <laughs> I'm done. And you stop. And like, I can't read it. It's too complicated. And you're reading all this King James. Well, the, first of all, let me tell you something about the Bible. The Bible is a library full of 66 books. And you don't have to read it like a novel from start to end. The best way to find God is through Jesus Christ, who is God. So I want to encourage you to start with Jesus, because that's where it all comes from. Why not take 15 minutes a day and just take the time? The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33 to 37, another scripture you should memorize, seek first the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom? God's kingdom is his ways. Seek first the kingdom, that's God's ways. In other words, you invite God's kingdom. Now, there's a kingdom of the United States. You know, the kingdom of the United States is of our laws. In fact, the reason why you got here this morning, because the kingdom of the United States has speed limits and has roads, and there's organization, and that organization allowed you to come here this morning. 
Why? Because the kingdom of the United States is here. There's a government here that got you here this morning. By its, by its government, it allowed you to drive on the roads. Does that make sense? I hope you're catching what I'm trying to say. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you as well. So seek first the kingdom of God. Well, seeking first the kingdom of God is first to hear his voice. And that every day, Jesus told Satan, when Satan said, eat this bread, he says, no, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that continually proceeds out of the mouth of God. So my friends, if you and I are gonna learn to know what God has for us, we have to learn every day to hear his word. And how do you do that? I encourage you to start with the New Testament. Start with Jesus. Start with the Gospels. Take 15 minutes a day. Carve out a time, a non-negotiable time. Like you wouldn't think of going to work without brushing your hair if you have any. You wouldn't think of going to work in your pajamas, would you? But yet we go, we go, to, we go in our world without being spiritually dressed. Why not take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, get to a quiet place, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you please open my eyes today and start reading in Matthew. Take 15 minutes, get a pen, get a paper, or get a highlighter, or, or iPad, or whatever you use, and when you're reading and something jumps out at you, underline it, and then go back and pray over it. And this is what I've done. I just want to show you, just the other day, I'm going to pick at random uh, one of my devotionals the other day. I'm going to go back to my devotionals here. Let me pick one from this past, uh, let me see here. I'll pick this one here. Okay. I was reading through Amos the other day, an exciting book. And I'll, this is what I read. In my vision, the locusts ate every green plant in sight. And then I said, oh, sovereign Lord, please forgive us, or we will not survive. For Israel is so small. So the Lord relented from his plan. I will not do it, he said. And I read that passage of scripture. And so I wrote there in my little notes, I said there, God changes his path and his plan when we pray. And then I went on to write later on when that that if we remain steadfast, God will reward us. Don't worry about the fake church, which is the church of Satan, but focus on what's really important. Focus on trusting God. And I continue to write here that if you will pray, God will move. And so I, I, I thought about that. So I go, okay, God, that means when I pray, things change. No, I can't pray. any. That's another time. But I, the point I'm trying to bring your attention is this, that our prayers are not immaterial. Our prayers are powerful for the bringing down the strongholds. We're going to get into that, how to pray in January. But I, pray, I, I read that. And then later on, I read in Revelation about something else. I read, um, I said, look, uh, Revelation 3, 9 through 10, I, I read this. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they're Jews but are not, to come down and bow at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Now, I read that, and I wrote down here. Remain steadfast, and God will reward us. Don't worry about the fake church, which is the church of Satan. In other words, don't worry about trying to please man, please God. So I, I read that, and that's just an example. I just pulled it out of, I just pulled one of my journals out. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll just go ahead and read that, and I'll underline it, and I'll pray it back. God, you said you'd lead me to your truth. Okay, so I'll take 15 minutes, and then pray it through. Then ask God to bless your day. Say, God, I give you this day. And what begins to happen, you do that every single day. You get the word of God in you. And what also begins to happen, when you're reading the Bible, what happens is the scripture jumps off the page. When it jumps off the page, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And that's God's voice. The more you hear God's voice, the more you hear it. The more you hear his voice, the more you understand it. Some of you, I call you on the phone, I know it's you, not because of caller ID. I know your voice. And so that's part of it. Seek first the kingdom of God. I, I can't tell you. We can lay hands on you. We could have the best teachers in the world, but unless you learn to feed yourself, you're not going to be growing very strong in God. So start small. Start small. Start with the scripture. Start 15 minutes a day. Try it. Try it for 40, 50, 60 days and see what's going to happen. I guarantee you it's going to make a change in your life because my word will not return to me void. So I want to encourage you to do that. Get in the Lord. Get into the scriptures. A daily dependence. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's all part of it. Now, there's something else I want to conclude with here this morning. And it's this. Thomas said to Jesus in John chapter 14. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? How many of us feel that way sometimes? God, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening with my, my job. My marriage, I don't know what's going on with the business. I don't know what's going on with my health. 
I don't know how I'm going to take care of my parents. I don't know how to take care of my kids. I'm not quite sure how to get the kids to do the right thing. I don't know how I'm supposed to pay my bills. God, I don't know the way. God, what's the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And when Jesus says, I am, he's saying, I am God. I am God of the way. I am the God of the truth. I am God of the life. So what is that supposed to mean? What that means is you find your way through Jesus Christ. He's the path. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. So if you don't know which way to go, I want to encourage you to go to Jesus. That's why I encourage you to start reading the Bible. Start with the New Testament. Start with Jesus. Start with the Gospels. Start right there, 15 minutes a day. I want to encourage you to, number one, make a commitment. I'm going to spend time with God, 10 or 15 minutes a day. I'm going to carve out a time. Find somebody else you can say, keep accountable to. Maybe say, did you do it today? Okay, do that. Number two, commit yourself to come to church with other people who believe and then be encouraged. And this is kind of like our, having our Sunday meal together. We'll get around the table. Mom made a pot roast or dad made a pot roast. We're having a good time. But you still need to eat during the rest of the day. Okay? Commit yourself to read every day. Commit yourself to come to church. All right? Commit yourself to find another person that can encourage you in your faith. Another man, another woman. Okay? If you're married, another man. Uh, if you're a man, another man. A woman, another woman. Right? To keep you encouraged you in that so they can get how you doing. What did the Lord show you today? I should be able to come up to you guys and ask you, what did the Lord show you this week? Uh, listen, every day he's going to speak to you. Every day he's going to show you something. So commit yourself to read the word every day. Commit yourself to come to church every day. I mean every day, every week. Commit yourself to get involved with another person to know them. And commit yourself to share what you've learned and give to somebody else. Listen, if you will do that, I guarantee you, 100% guarantee you, you're going to grow in God. And you're going to be surprised. What's going to happen is it's going to start filling you up. It's like a sponge. You see, if you don't like what's coming out of you, change what's going in you. We say, that's good preaching. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Okay. If you don't like what's coming out of you, change what's going in you. And so these holidays have a wonderful way of squeezing you, isn't it? And stuff comes out of you. You know, you're par you know what's happening. It's happened to me uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm trying to find a parking space because it's raining outside. I'm going around the mall. I'm circling around like a, like a vulture around a roadkill. And I found this wonderful space. This person pulls out and this person <laughs> pulls in. And I'm like, praise God, hallelujah. God, thank you that I could bless this person with this parking space. <laughs> I wish I could say that was my response. You see... You don't like what's coming out of you. Listen, when you start getting more of God in you, it's going to change you. Let me say something else that's not in my notes that I need to talk about for a second. If you don't like what's happening in our world today, how about we make a change? I don't know about you, but I'm very disturbed what happened in New York City yesterday. Two police officers were shot and killed, execution style, right in the front, and they're in a patrol car. All this racial tension that's happening in our country right now. I, I'm not, I'm not going to get into politics. It's not about that. You know the answer to all that is? Jesus Christ. Jesus made every single person, whether you're black, white, rich, poor, whatever you are, Hispanic, what does it make a difference who you are? That every person is made in the image of God. Every person has value. Every person is valuable to God. And we have to stop. We, well, how, how am I supposed to make a change? You know how you make a change? When you're at work, when you're, someone says a racial comment, oh, I can't believe those, the uh, whites, they do this, the cops do it, or the blacks do that. You know, say, you know what? Those people are made in the image of God. We should pray for them. You know, say something positive. Make a change. And, and you know what? We need to be praying for what's happening right now. I don't know if this is true. And I heard there was another, I don't have to verify this, but I heard there was another shooting in Florida. I don't know if that's true or not today. But this is going on. There's, there's racial tension happening. And there's people just kind of sitting there and, and spewing it out. And it's crazy what's happening. How do we make a change today? What does it have to do with our sermon? <laughs> Everything. You know why? Because we're called to be change agents in this world. We're called to make a difference. How do we make a difference? We make a difference by praying. We make a difference by changing one life at a time. I don't know if you realize this. It can be overwhelming at times. I heard a story one time of a boy on the beach, and there was a bunch of starfish, and they were dying. 
And uh, he took that starfish and he was throwing it into the ocean. And he's throwing it and the guy came up to him and said, what do you think you're doing? You think you're going to save these starfish? He says, I'm going to save this one. And he throws it into the ocean. My friends, you don't understand the impact you and I can have. When we stop saying it's about our life, it's not about our life. It's about Jesus Christ. And we're here for a purpose. We're here for a reason. And there's people dying out there. There's people that are going through difficult times, and they're looking for someone. God says, I looked to find someone to go in between. I could find no one. Why can't you and I be that person that says, God, it's not about my life. It's about your life, Father. I want to do your way. And what's your way? Instead of yelling at the TV set, instead of telling some upset at something, what would happen if we prayed? Father, let's pray right now, fact. Let's just pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we are in, we're in the United States. You've made us to live in this place. Father, we see the turmoil going on right now in the world. We see what's going on right here in our country. We see the racial divide. We see all the hate speech and how uh, psychologically unstable people are gathering guns and shooting police officers. Father, we're asking in Jesus' name, Father, that you would touch those families that were, uh, were gunned down, Father God. We pray for the Ferguson case. We, we pray for the gentleman that was choked. Lord, we, we don't want to pick sides. We just want to see you come and change this planet and change this world. Father, I ask that we would be avenues of hope and light. Father, during this dark time where death surrounds us, we know that Jesus Christ came in a dark place to bring life. Father, we don't want to despise the days of small beginnings, but God, we pray that we would say that when we see something evil happen, we're going to pray. We're going to stand up for the truth. We're going to give people dignity in Jesus' name. And so, Father, I ask that you'd send peace upon our country. Father, we ask in this church would be a model of how different races, different ethne, different social economic statuses, different abilities would all join together and value each other because we're made in the image of God. That we would not look high or low, but we'd see every single person as a gift from you, designed by you, made by you. God, we want to be people that make a difference in this world. And Father, we thank you we thank you, Lord, that you place us at this time in history. Forgive us, God, for thinking that it's all about us. Forgive us, Father, for trying to comfort ourselves and live our American dream. When you're waiting for a people, you're waiting for a church that will reach out and change. So, Lord, change us in Jesus' name. Father, I, I pray right now, God, that you would touch us, God, that we would do that. Lord, that we would set aside. And I know some of you are saying, I can do more than 10 minutes. Well, start with 10 minutes. Father, that we would take every day, that we'd set aside a time for you, a non-negotiable time, and take time to read your word, to pray. Lord, I pray that we would take the opportunity to commit ourselves to coming to church and commit ourselves to finding another person we can talk to and pray with. And Father, that we would share the good news with others. Lord, we thank you. You have us here for a reason. We thank you for that. We just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not. Was that, was that, was that off the whole time? Okay. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things will be added to you. Listen, when you don't know which way to go, God's going to show you one step at a time. He's been faithful through my life. When I take these small little steps, you know what I find out when I continue to walk? The more I walk, little steps, the next thing you know, you turn around, you've walked miles. When you continue to walk the right path in God every day, you will get to the destination God will have for you. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And if you don't know who Jesus is, if you have not given your life to Christ, there's no way this is going to work for you. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads one more time. I'm going to pray a closing prayer for this. Father, I thank you for dying on the cross. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me my sins. I choose to follow you from this day forward. I give my life to you. I declare that you are the boss and I am not. I ask you to change me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Thank you that what you did on the cross forgives me. I surrender my life to you. I am no longer my own, but I am yours. Fill me with your spirit and let me walk in your path in Jesus' name.
Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, it's just a beginning. Listen, guys, let's make a difference in this world. Let's bring peace in this turmoil. Let's, let's, let's be a people that hear God and walk. He has a purpose. He has a plan. But no, do what he's told you to do now. What he shows you now, do, and he'll show you more. That's just how it works. Progressively, every day, and see what God will do in your life. Amen? You have a closing song, please. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. And God bless you guys. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I surrender. May the peace of Christ surround you. May his glory over others shout you. May his path be yours today as you follow him in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. You're dismissed. I was